Well, thanks everyone for joining. We're going to start on time because we've actually got quite a lot of uh, material. We've got three speakers in a fairly short period of time. We really want to save time uh, at the end for Alex Dickinson of, uh, of Illumina to talk about their use cases. Subject today is best practices for HPC in the cloud, high performance computing in the cloud. Uh, before we start, um, how many are actually working in HPC domains today? Um, good, great. Um, public sector research HPC, how many uh, public sector? Engineering workloads? Great, super. Uh, life sciences, uh, pharmaceuticals, financial computing? Uh, not so much financial. Okay, great. A few. So we'll talk about a few of those use cases. We're going to focus primarily on engineering use cases and on life sciences today as uh, examples of, of high-performance computing workloads that are, that are coming into the cloud now and coming in rapidly. So to, to really start this off, if you watch the keynote today from Andy, uh, I'm sure he touched on this uh, repeatedly, uh, as he does often. The idea that there's a number of ways that organizations are coming into the cloud today. And this is certainly true in high-performance computing. We can really think of, uh, of three primary ways that users and applications come into the cloud. The first you might think of as the little move. Um, where you're taking existing HPC infrastructure, you're simply, you've reached capacity, you need additional capacity, so you reach out to the cloud for those additional resources, those additional cycles. So that, that kind of uh, peak load bursting to the cloud is a, is a very good use case. It's very common. We're also seeing uh, much larger movements into the cloud of very large scalable workloads. High-performance computing, of course, has many different varied workloads. And moving those applications that are most appropriate for cloud into the cloud, scale-out workloads, right, highly parallel workloads, uh, can, can be a great approach. So rather than build that next cluster or expand that data center, actually scale out those applications in the cloud. Once you begin to understand, though, this, this uh, advantages you have of scalability in the cloud, of the uh, very low cost of going very wide in computations, you can begin to think about entirely new applications that you might perform in the cloud. And uh, we'll touch on this later in the life sciences community. Once the data is in one place, you have locality of data and compute, you have scalability, you can begin to think, think about entirely new models. And you can think of Hadoop as being one example of, of a workload, uh, a type of workload that built as a result of having the availability of high scale. So why AWS? Why, why bring your workloads here? Uh, one, one aspect of this that's often touched on uh, in the HPC community is security. Is the, is the cloud really secure? Well, this is our job. This is our job every day to think about security. So absolutely, security is there in the cloud. You have virtual private cloud. You have uh, all of the same basic controls that you have in your own on-prem data center. Financial computing is in the cloud in a big way today. It's, it's really a non-issue at this point. But we do have security and compliance experts if you want to have that deep dive discussion. The biggest benefit for HPC, of course, is agility. You can use the types of instances, the types of servers, the types of storage that you need for a given application. You can scale up extremely wide and scale down when you don't need those resources anymore. That's a huge benefit relative to building an on-prem cluster for HPC. And that ties into the cost savings. There's a talk later today, by the way, at 5.30 on cost optimizations on AWS, so I won't touch on that too much today. Let's talk about agility, though. When we talk to high-performance computing infrastructure teams, uh, one thing that we hear repeatedly is that, hey, I'm OK, no problem. My cluster runs at 100% utilization. I'm good, right? So what does that mean? There is no HPC cluster out there that actually is steady state workload. So what that means is that they've got a job queue that grows and shrinks, right? So if your job queue runs, it's 10 minutes deep, that may be OK. 10 hours deep, that's painful. 10 days, that happens. Right? So they're not really getting the benefit of agility. They're having a, a really poor customer experience, even though they're running at 100% utilization, and maybe that cluster pencils out pretty good from an IT infrastructure perspective. But because of our economies of scale, we can provide much lower uh, cost of ownership of that cluster, even if you did have that mythical, perfect, 100% utilized workload. I think I'm not advancing here. A 
Can you advance the slide for me, please? Yeah, it froze. We're running that on our on-prem cluster. I think it's a Beowulf. There we go. So again, I'm not going to talk much about uh, the benefits of, of cost. There is a cost optimization session at 5.30 today. But it's important to understand for scale-out workloads, the ability of, availability of things like spot instance pricing to allow you to scale extremely wide at a very low cost opportunistically when the price is low and scale back down when the price is, is higher. And that's something that you can do on AWS that you really can't do anywhere else, and certainly not in your on-prem cluster. For those steady state uh, critical workloads, maybe the master node of your cluster or your database server, reserved instances are, are a great option there. And again, you can, you can learn more about those, uh, those cost models and availability models uh, on aws.amazon.com or in the cost optimization session later today. Are we still frozen? Advance, please. <laughs> there we go. Let's just advance once more. Thank you very much. This is like my uh, wireless Microsoft mouse at home. All right, so again, scalability is, is key. Many of the workloads that we see coming onto AWS in financial computing, in engineering, uh, in, in, in oil and gas types of applications are, are embarrassingly parallel Monte Carlo simulations and other such applications that can scale extremely wide for high performance. So going from, from one or a small number of instances uh, to literally thousands is practical on AWS. And this is no exaggeration. We, we on a regular basis, see applications uh, spun up in pharmaceuticals, in, in engineering, uh, in other domains, high energy physics, that literally involve thousands of servers for some number of hours. Then the cluster's shut down. They don't pay for it anymore. They got the job done. And if you're using spot pricing for that, uh, the cost advantage of, of, doing the, uh, of doing that, of going wider, are just amazing. Uh, we have partners who can help with that, Cycle Computing uh, being one. Uh, excellent partner uh, serving pharmaceutical and other domains. Uh, there are open source projects out there like Star Cluster that help you to bring up a cluster uh, using spot instances on AWS to scale very, very wide. Uh, th so there's an increasing domain or, or ecosystem of third party partners and open source software to help you scale up very rapidly and very large on uh, AWS. Uh, third party uh, tools that you may be familiar with uh, for scheduling, such as uh, LSF. Uh, SunGrid Engine, et cetera. All of those play well with, uh, with AWS. We have uh, solutions architects with deep domain knowledge of these schedulers. If you need help uh, in bringing up a cluster, uh, contact us. We probably have CloudFormation templates. We probably have some expertise and some examples to help you spin up a cluster very, very fast for your application. Again, uh, there we go. Another thing to think about in terms of agility is the fact that we've got such a wide range of instance types now. What often happens in the HPC world, if you're running engineering applications or you're running some, you know, some life sciences application, what you end up doing on-premise is building the cluster for the worst, nastiest problem that you have, right? And so you get this big, expensive cluster that for most of the workloads running on it doesn't really need to be there, right? You might be just as, just as, uh, uh, as satisfied by running a, a commodity cluster of, of previous generation uh, you know, CPUs to do some large, scalable workload. On AWS, you can spin up a cluster of exactly the instance types you need. If you need a high memory instances, we've got them. But if you don't, if you have an application that's more uh, I.O. bound or just a scale out workflow that's, that's not really compute intensive, but you just need not lots and lots of nodes, you can spin that up as well using different instance types and cost optimize around instance types. In the past uh, year to a year and a half, you've seen on AWS the EC2 instance types in the area of cluster compute, our CC2 8XL, our, our recently announced CR1, Sandy Bridge architectures, lots and lots of RAM, uh, higher performance interconnects, very appropriate for scale-out uh, workloads, 
and for uh, uh, workloads that are, that are really pretty tightly wound around uh, low latency as well. More coming in the future, the, you know, the, the AWS instance types um, are rolling out on a regular basis. You can expect over time that you'll have access to many new instance types, many new capabilities for HPC uh, as we roll out these new features. Just touch briefly on innovation again. You've heard this story again and again. But for HPC, this is, this is just so very important to think about. The idea that you can fail fast, right? You can scale up a very large simulation in a matter of minutes, a matter of hours, have a very large run, try something out. If it doesn't work out, shut it down, not spend too much money. You can, you, it's something you just can't do in an in a enterprise or research HPC domain. You've got to get in the job queue, right? You've got to get support from the IT infrastructure. Or maybe you have to go to procurement and purchase that cluster or expand that cluster to try some experiment. That's an enormous benefit of going to the cloud for your HPC workloads. So I've got a, a two-second latency on this I figured out. And this is the muck you want to avoid, right? So uh, there's a lot of uh, you know, talk about being, being a DevOps in, this, in, the, in, the, uh, in the startup community, really understanding the infrastructure top to bottom. But if you're an HPC researcher or an algorithm developer, you don't want to be a, necessarily a DevOps. You, you, you want to bring up the cluster. You want to run your application, get your answer, and, and shut it down, right? without having the, the, the vast uh, array of IT uh, infrastructure behind you, that army of, of cluster management uh, staff and middleware. Let us take care of that, right? You spin up the cluster, run your job management tool, bring your application up and run it, and bring it down when you're done. I want to focus on use cases now, and, and Alex will be up in a, you know, shortly to talk about Illumina's specific use case in life sciences. We'll touch on some others when, when Joffer comes up and talks about the life sciences applications in general. But I want to, again, emphasize there are many different scale-out and scale-up workloads on AWS today. Uh, some of these are very large consumers of cycles, uh, whether in their own data centers or on AWS or a combination of both. We're seeing an increasing uptick in use of AWS for engineering workflows. These include things like uh, high energy uh, simulations, EM simulations, right, for, for printed circuit board design. We're seeing uh, increasing numbers of electronic design automation workflows, RTL simulations, uh, and the like. Certainly in life sciences, whether it's uh, genomics, uh, you know, uh, de novo assembly or, or alignment. Uh, you know, SNP calling and so forth in life sciences. Uh, energy uh, reservoir estimations, right? That's another scale out, highly uh, scalable job. Uh, Monte Carlo simulation being a common method there. Uh, and in the, in the high energy physics uh, domain, uh, lots and lots of simulations happening at the national labs on AWS. Financial services, I mentioned before, has been a, a very big user of AWS to do risk analytics, to do uh, options valuations, value at risk calculations, a uh, very large uptick in that for regulatory reasons. Uh, uh, new emphasis on, on correctly modeling uh, future events and, and avoiding things like flash crashes by doing actual backtesting of algorithms in the high frequency domain. Lots and lots of use cases in financial services are on AWS today. I'll touch briefly on, on engineering applications, and then we'll move quickly into life sciences with Jafar Shamim. In engineering, we see applications that uh, span the CAD domain, uh, whether it's 3D modeling, uh, collaboration of, of projects across the globe, uh, electromagnetic simulations I've mentioned before, and electronic design automation. An increasing number of the ISVs out there, the independent software vendors, in these domains are now embracing the cloud. It's taken some of them a little bit of time, but now because of customer pressure, they really are allowing us now to, uh, to scale up applications for users to bring their own licenses, for example, into the cloud for scalability. CFD applications, FAE applications, vendors such as, as Comsol, for example, allowing you to scale up in the cloud, providing either bring your own license kinds of applications where you manage your own cluster, 
or software as a service types of applications, or, or hybrids of the two. Quick example of, of CFD, this uh, Aerodynamic Solutions, a small company, SBIR shop, uh, did a, a great uh, simulation project uh, that was SBIR funded for the U.S. Air Force. This is a nice example because it was very uh, uh, security and compliance sensitive, right? ITAR data, the arms uh, regulations, right? So they, they had spent a lot of time investigating AWS and the security that was possible through uh, encryption of data in flight and at rest and, and scaling up the computation. Uh, but at the end of the day, they, they were able to bring up this uh, large CFD simulation, hundreds of nodes, spin it up, get the job done in 10 hours, spin it back down, and pay very little money to do that. Um, and that's a perfect example of a, of a quick scale-out workload, a one-time run that you might repeat for a number of jobs. You don't necessarily have to predict the size of the cluster. There's no job queue, right? You just bring it up, run it, get the answer, tear it down. Another great example recently, an ASIC uh, uh, development company uh, over in Europe that does uh, um, uh, detectors for, uh, for uh, airport screening and so forth, gamma ray detectors. So they needed to do some very large uh, simulations of, of high energy physics, basically, gamma ray simulations. And they were using a Monte Carlo type of method, an embarrassingly parallel scale out algorithm. Perfect use case, because they can, they can scale out almost arbitrarily, right? In their case, uh, 4,000 uh, servers, not cores, servers on AWS brought up for a short period of time to run the simulation, get the answer, and shut it down. And because they were using spot instances to do that, they could find the times of day, the times of week, when those uh, spot instance prices were very, very low for that particular high-performance instance type, spin it up fast, get the answer, spin it down, paid very little money. We actually have a lot of case studies on the AWS website about using spot instances for that kind of cost optimization for very high-scale computing. Quick note about how you would run your, your third-party software, whether you're uh, you know, running uh, Cadence or Synopsys or Mentor in the EDA space or Comsol, et cetera, in the CFD space, many, many ISVs out there. And this is a, a discussion you can have with your ISV, your, your independent software provider, whether you should bring your own license, what, you know, what are the terms of your license, how is it managed, is it FlexLM, right? What, what is the, the licensing method? All of those things can be supported. Uh, you really should think about AWS in terms of uh, virtual private cloud and the capabilities we offer as being not really so different from having your own data center because you now have access to subnets and, and policies, VPN and so forth. You can create your licensed servers uh, on the cloud or back in your own premise. You can manage uh, multiple software vendors' tools through the license management systems that you already do, whether you're doing it on-prem or on the cloud or both. So that's a conversation uh, that you can have with your ISVs that's primarily going to be around license terms, not so much around technology, because the technology is there to support your current method of using these tools including the cluster management tools. If you're using platform LSF, if you're using other schedulers to manage these jobs, you can use the same methods on AWS. Uh, vendors out there today, uh, there's a range of them. Some of them uh, have that bring your own license kind of a model where you just use us as a data center. Some are experimenting with what you might think of as the hybrid cloud where some of the compute intensive tasks in their tool like 3D modeling goes to the, uh, goes to the cloud and others are actually building software as a service, Nimbic uh, in the EDA space being a good example. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to, to Joffer to talk about the life sciences use cases in particular and how scale-out computing is helping in that domain. No, it's the same deck. No, no, it's the same deck. Yeah. Hi. So as uh, the screen uh, unfreezes, just to give you a quick background, so I work with David in, uh, 
Kenny? Uh, can you hear me now, or is it not good? <laughs> is, is on now? All right. So uh, I work with David in business development, and both of us focus on high-performance computing. And I've had the privilege to work with life sciences customers over the past year and a half, two years, uh, working in Amazon Web Services. And what we found was Amazon Web Services has a rich history in life sciences, where life sciences customers and the community of researchers and scientists found out this immense resource that Amazon Web Services was offering in the form of large-scale compute, uh, storage, uh, ability to be able to uh, ask for as much storage and compute uh, as the researchers wanted. And the community grew uh, and started moving more and more workloads on AWS. So what I'll talk about briefly today is some examples of what customers have been able to do on Amazon Web Services, what they're doing now, what are some of the services that they will start using as they start leveraging Amazon Web Services, and some of the questions that they, uh, they ask uh, as they start experimenting with Amazon Web Services, and how, if you were to uh, look to start moving some of your workloads, how would you get started? So, like I mentioned, we have a rich history uh, working with the life sciences community, a lot of our features, for example, the cluster compute instances that Dave mentioned earlier, large memory instances, were informed by our collaboration with the life sciences community. And in the spirit of collaboration, we've been working very diligently with the community to see what else could we do to help make it easier for researchers and scientists to be able to uh, do science better and be, uh, make it seamless for them to uh, move their workloads, uh, help them uh, do the analysis that they want to do. So to that end, we have been adding to this resource that we call AWS public data sets, uh, within which you can today find 1,000 genomes data set, for example, Ensemble. Again, tremendous resource. The data set is already there. You move your data to AWS. The compute's already there. And all you need to do is just fire a bunch of resources easily using a bunch of open source tools or commercially available uh, software to help you do the analysis. And over years, an open source ecosystem has grown where if you're a researcher, a bioinformatician, or even uh, somebody who's dabbling in com computational chemistry, there's software available already out there in the form of Amazon machine images, and also a number of uh, software as service providers who are providing service in this space uh, to researchers and scientists. And then if you are making your own cluster, for example, you want to uh, fire up a 100 node, a 1,000 node cluster. There are a variety of workload schedulers, cluster managers, such as Star Cluster being one very important and popular uh, cluster manager that you could use today sitting down over here, fire up whatever resources that you wanted to, and pay for it only as you uh, use them. And it's And it continues to grow. What we're trying to do is trying to find out what, what, is, what else is out there that customers want to use, researchers and scientists want to use. And we support a variety of these open source projects. So if you find something that's not over here or on our websites, reach out to us. We'll be glad to work with the community to figure out how else to make it easier for people to do science on AWS, run large-scale HPC applications on AWS. Back? All right, this is good. So this is another example of a software that's commonly used, Galaxy. Uh, it's available on Amazon Web Services. You want to start using it, 
couple of clicks of a button, and you're up and running. No longer do you have to wait for resources in your universities or your uh, data center, uh, wait for operation folks to be able to provision you the cluster that you may need to run uh, software like these. And the reason customers are telling us why they're moving to Amazon Web Services is because what AWS is doing is removing the constraints that you, they usually face in their own environments and lets them focus on the problem, the science, the research that they're trying to do. And science is eventually about experimentation. And like David mentioned, what AWS is doing is removing the barrier to be able to experiment at will because the cost of experimentation is so low now. You can ask for uh, whatever amount of resources you want and pay for only for the resources that you uh, are, uh, are using and ask bigger and better pro uh, questions. For example, uh, just this past year, Cycle Computing, uh, one of our partners, helped one of our customers do a virtual screening of seven million compounds in less than three hours, something that they said would have taken them more than 10 years to do by themselves in their own data centers. So a lot is changing in this space. It's very exciting to be uh, a scientist, a researcher, and have this tremendous resource available in the form of AWS. So now, once people start using AWS, and especially folks in the genomics community can relate to this, there's a lot of data that's being generated. And the second question we get asked when we talk to customers uh, is, how do we move the data? The first question, obviously, is, are you guys secure? And I think David uh, touched upon that. Security is priority zero over here. Without that, uh, I mean, we don't have a business. So it's taken very seriously. Customers are very comfortable uh, moving their sensitive workloads to AWS. And the second question they'll ask is, how do you transfer data? So there are three high-level kind of uh, mechanisms by which you can transfer data to AWS. One is you can still ship disks and move data into AWS using our import-export service and ask us to ship those disks back to you, uh, something that customers do, that, do regularly with AWS today. And the second more and more popular option is leveraging AWS Direct Connect, by which you can establish direct connection from your existing infrastructure to AWS in the form of one gig or 10 gig ports or multiple of those uh, as uh, you may need. And then if you already have a pretty good connection to the internet, you could leverage that uh, and use some of the bandwidth optimization solutions. There is uh, a variety of open source as well as commercially available solutions. If you're a research institution, chances are you're already using some of those. Globus Online is a very popular one uh, in the educational space, as well as uh, Tsunami UDP uh, is used uh, very widely. And in terms of commercial providers in life sciences, Aspera uh, is used quite often. And then uh, Alex will talk about this after this, after my talk, is basically as the data is being generated from, for example, Illumina's instruments, they're giving you an option to move the data directly to S3 so that it makes it easier for you to be able to have the data when you need it to run the analysis that you want to run. And once you move the data, uh, chances are most probably you're going to use S3 as the data store, but there's a lot of other storage options that we're providing to you to uh, do all kinds of magic that the researchers and scientists do. You have relational databases at your disposal. You have NoSQL data stores such as SimpleDB and DynamoDB at your disposal. And now recently we announced the availability of Redshift, uh, data warehousing as a service, uh, and we can't wait to see what the research and scientific community is going to uh, use Redshift for and innovate on top of this. S3, for example, used very widely, not just in life sciences, across uh, a variety of use cases at Amazon, and it's over two trillion objects stored already in S3. And now, uh, last year we announced availability of Amazon Glacier, the same durability that S3 provides you at a fraction of the cost, one cents a gig a month. It's tremendously important for folks that have a lot of data that they want to use uh, and archive. It's a Great option for uh, saving money, not relying on heavy tape libraries that customers had to use to move uh, a lot of the archival data to. And application services. So once your data is there, obviously you can, I showed you some options as to firing up some pipelines, leveraging some of the open source tools available. You can create your own custom pipelines. You could run Star Cluster. Uh, you can run Torque, uh, SunGrid Engine, whatever scheduler that uh, you're familiar with. But more and more we're seeing customers and scientists uh, look at the MapReduce as prob probably a way to 
look at the data, uh, do analysis on the data. And uh, what we've seen over the years, uh, running MapReduce internally and for customers, we made a service called Elastic Map, MapReduce available, taking the mock of uh, managing, installing, and configuring uh, Apache Hadoop infrastructure yourself. We'll give it to you at a click of a button or through an API command line where you can fire up as big a cluster as you may want and leverage spot pricing, for example, and this is something I'll touch upon briefly later, to reduce the cost of running large-scale analytics on top of your data. So now your data is here, ways to compute on your data is there, the scale is there, so it's very appealing for a lot of researchers and communities uh, to be able to leverage the AWS services. This is, shows this, the adoption rate of uh, Elastic MapReduce over five and a half million Hadoop clusters since uh, the service was announced. And Crossbow is one ex example of a uh, pipeline that leverages Elastic MapReduce in the back end. So people are already innovating on top of this. They have been doing this for quite some time, and we feel that this will uh, continue, and we'll continue to release new services, some of the services that I have. I don't have time to touch upon today, but SQS, uh, a simple workflow service, vi very widely used uh, in this space. Now I'll go through quickly through some examples of what customers are doing. For example, Pfizer, when they started to look at uh, AWS, when they're running out of capacity or they wanted to extend their own uh, uh, R&D capabilities, they looked at AWS and leveraged virtual private cloud offering that AWS has to seamlessly extend their existing infrastructure to, into the cloud, offering their uh, end users the benefit of taking advantage of such a scalable resource. Spiral Genetics, another startup in this space that is innovating on top of a platform by offering customers the ability to sequence whole genomes, exomes, uh, in with a very fast turnaround time, leveraging all the immense compute that's available at the back end of AWS, making it seamless for the end user so you don't have to worry about doing your own clusters if you don't have to. You can use service providers that are building on top of AWS. Same way Globus Genomics is doing the same thing. They're using a Galaxy platform. They already have a mechanism by which you can transfer data to AWS, uh, to S3, to EBS, and from there, you can fire up Galaxy, making it seamless for you to be able to run Galaxy uh, as a service uh, on top of Amazon Web Services. Again, people innovating on your behalf so you don't have to do even this if you don't have to. This is an example of a company that's uh, providing a, a data platform to manage all this data that's being generated by, uh, in the genomics, in the omics space, for example. Howard Medical School, an early adopter for AWS, they've been using AWS for quite some time, and they leverage spot instances. For those of you who may not know what spot is, at any, any given time, we have immense scale, a lot of capacity, and the unused capacity is available for you to bid upon whatever price that you may want to bid upon, uh, and very useful for highly scalable workloads. There's a session later that'll uh, touch upon this. I highly encourage those of you in the high performance community with large scale workloads to go take a look at uh, what spot pricing model is, as well as hear from a partner such as Cycle Computing as to how they seamlessly let you take advantage of this pricing to run, run large scale workloads. And, Harvard Medical School has been doing this for quite some time. A lot of tools have been written so that you don't have to worry about uh, how to bid for uh, the right price. Though the tools uh, will let you do that. Now I'll hand over to uh, Alex, who will talk about what Illumina has been doing in this space, uh, why they chose to build what they built on Amazon and what they have built on Amazon. Uh, and I'll leave you with one last word. So AWS is a self-service platform. You don't have to talk to us if you don't want to. However, we have grown to support our customers. So if you have any question, if you have any concerns, technical, any otherwise, feel free to reach out to us. We are expanding globally. Uh, any of us are in the, within our phone calls reach or in email. So uh, please uh, take advantage of all the resources that you have at your disposal. Disposal. Thanks.
Here we go. Um, thanks for the opportunity uh, today, uh, everybody. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, what Illumina uh, has been doing um, in the Amazon cloud. Um, I noticed there were not a lot of uh, life science folks here, so I'm just going to give a quick um, overview of, of uh, who Illumina is or what Illumina is. Um, it's about a 15-year-old um, company. Uh, we're down in San Diego. Um, we have about $1.2 billion in sales. And probably most importantly, about 90% of all the uh, DNA um, sequencing that's done in the world is done on Illumina sequences. So we have an unusual position in the market. Um, just the last couple of weeks, the stock market value has gone from about $6 billion to about $8 billion. So I've uh, got to love biotech. Um, Traditionally, the DNA sequencing business was a research business. So obviously, scientists were trying to work out how DNA worked. And so sequencing was interesting for decomposing those, um, uh, those strings of data and finding out what's going on. But probably over the last year, really, things have really heated up um, in the clinical markets. And sequencing is starting to be used uh, in uh, diagnosis um, in a bunch of different areas. In fact, sequencing has become um, we're starting to become very compelling in a number of different application areas. Uh, three big ones on the lower left there, um, research. Um, at around um, 1 o'clock, cancer, it's turning out that, um, I guess not unexpectedly, everybody's cancer is slightly different because cancer is a mutation of the genome. And so it becomes quite possible when you take a cancer patient to actually um, do whole genome sequencing on the cancer compare that to the healthy cell and get a very good idea of what the mutations are that are underlying the cancer. And down in the lower right, we just bought a company uh, called Veronata that's very active in reproductive health and uh, replaces a rather unpleasant procedure called amniocentesis that um, uh, pregnant mothers um, have to undergo. Um, so a lot of activity, but also everything from uh, forensics to infectious diseases, also a very active area for sequencing. So what is the genomic data problem? Um, the first whole human genome was done by the uh, Human Genome Project, uh, stretched over around 13 years, uh, 40 institutions, cost around $4 billion, um, and the end result of that was one single human genome. Uh, what's happened is sequencing has scaled much faster than Moore's Law, and so this year, one of our instruments, this is a picture of an instrument called a HiSeq uh, 2000, um, we'll do a whole human genome in a day, and we'll do it for thousands of dollars um, rather than uh, billions. So there's actually an extraordinary scaling um, underway inside sequencing. Um, just a quick side view of, of what actually happens in sequencing. We take um, a very small sample of DNA. Uh, we bust it up. So DNA is three billion, uh, a sequence of three billion different bases. We break it up into many small strands, and the things in the middle there are molecules, strands, say, of 200 bases long. We make them stand up um, on, a, on a very small sheet called a flow cell, and then we get them to all replicate. So we create these little clusters. And at the end of that process, you have these tiny little clusters of um, set amounts of DNA. And each cluster has identical cloned DNA in it. We go through a process, uh, and it's actually an optical process, of because that single-stranded DNA, we attach bases and fill in the other side of the DNA strand, if you're familiar with DNA as two um, interlocking complementary strands. And as each of those is added, we can see down the bottom there is we got a little flash of light, and it's different colors for different bases. And then by doing some um, image processing uh, on that, we can actually decompose that into the actual sequence of bases that comprise the DNA chain. Now, the numbers actually aren't all that impressive. If you look at, you've got 3 billion bases, and each base, there can be uh, one of four bases, so that comes out to 750 megabit, uh, megabytes of data. So it's kind of a, amazing. A human it can be represented by 750 megabytes of data, the, the human plan, if you will. But it turns out we all vary by less than 0.1%. So you don't keep the whole 750 megabytes. You actually only need to keep that small percentage that we all differ from one another, kind of a, a difference or delta modulation. And so you end up actually with only needing to conceptually, or at least theoretically, store about a megabyte of data to represent each human's DNA. But the reality is actually very different. So the instruments, as they're going through that image process, they generate much more than a terabyte of data um, while they're doing that. Then once that's been reduced down to the raw sequence data, we end up getting about 100 gig. 100 gig. It's actually around 120 gigabytes, which is the real core of the data that scientists like to keep. You can do some compression on it, uh, lossy and lossless compression. You can get it down to around 10 gigabytes. Um, and then the data that we work with in databases tends to be about one gigabyte. 
But because this is a pretty new area, um, scientists, researchers, and clinicians actually like to keep the raw data. So we keep around 120 gigabytes uh, for each human that has um, been sequenced. And this chart's interesting. The, the blue line is the improvement in sequencing. The green line is improvement, Moore's Law class improvement in uh, disk drives. And the purple line is Moore's Law class improvement in chips or CPUs. And so you can imagine if you just, if you just take a sequencer, it's kind of interesting. If we take a sequencer and we ship it with a computer, um, we upgrade the sequencers all the time, actually just by changing the chemistry. So sequencers, you buy one of our big sequencers for about $700,000 and it uses about $350,000 worth of reagents in a year. But we can keep on changing those reagents, and we actually make them better and better. So the data throughput of the instrument goes up, but there's a computer sitting next to it that, of course, is not improving. You know, they don't naturally uh, evolve to Moore's law unless you buy new ones. And so what happens is very quickly, you get a mismatch between the instrument capacity and the um, data processing capacity of the computer that went with the instrument. So it's an obvious, interesting application for cloud. When we ask our customers where do they spend their time, you can see that uh, it's composed of a number of different things, but in the middle there you'll see sequencing runs. So the actual time they spend sequencing is relatively small. Right now we're doing about a whole human genome in a day. What really kills them is the bioinformatics, and that's comprised of a lot of computationally in intensive um, processing that Jafar mentioned, and also now interpretation, and a lot of interactive kind of fiddly stuff to do with, I've got a genome here, what does it actually mean about the health of the patient underlying it? But this chart, you know, makes it obvious, if you will, that we need to be focusing very much on bioinformatics in the sequencing business. So our solution was to build something we call BaseSpace, which is a cloud system um, for doing bioinformatics. This overview, obviously we're running it um, on AWS for reasons that will become apparent. Um, we have the instruments, and there you can see um, our HiSeq instruments, which are, you might think of as the mainframe um, instrument that we have. And then we have a smaller instrument called the MySeq, which is a desktop sequencer. MySeq produces about, you could think of it as 10 gigabytes a day, um, and the HiSeq produces, as I mentioned, about 100 gigabytes per day. Um, so for some reason the arrows aren't going to pop up on this. But what we do is we connect the, uh, we just, in the labs, um, we just connect those instruments up to base space using standard inter internet connections. It turns out that the instruments, even though they produce a lot of data, do it at a relatively regular pace. So if you take a genome on a day, that 120 gigabytes, and you break it down, do a little compression on it, it only ends up at about seven megabits per second. So obviously seven megabits per second is not a big deal um, to have these instruments streaming up into the cloud. We connect users up. Um, we've built an app store. We have third-party uh, providers building apps in the base space app store. Um, Illumina support and engineering gets to now monitor in real time the performances of all the instruments in the field. Illumina has a dual business model. We sell the instruments to people all over the world. Um, they install them and buy reagents from us and run them all over the place, as you'll see in a minute. But we also run our own sequencing factories where we take human samples in and we create whole human genome data out of them and distribute that back out to our customers. And base space is used in both of those. There's a lot of interesting public genome databases that researchers use. And we're also getting close to interconnecting electronic medical records in. Again, as Illumina gets more tied into the medical system, um, that becomes critical. Whoa. <laughs> I'm going to make up the slide um, while this gets fixed. Um, so why is this useful, or why is the cloud useful to us? Obviously, it's useful because uh, scalability. We have more instruments producing more data. We estimate that it, there's about a petabyte of data being produced by Illumina instruments worldwide uh, every week. So it's a substantial amount of um, information. Traditionally, that information has been very siloed. So an institution will have a sequencer or an array of sequences, they'll pump it into local disk, and there it sits, available to those researchers. One of the great things about moving it up into a cloud infrastructure is that same phenomena you see on Flickr or even on Facebook. The ability to share these data sets from one researcher or one clinician to another is a very, very powerful thing. Um, and so we've created a system where they could have a 120 gigabyte data set. You'd be sitting there going, how am I going to send that to anybody? We can create a link, and they can pass that link to a collaborator. Um, honest to God, in 2013, the basic mechanism for distributing whole human genome data right now is still um, mailing, physically mailing hard disks around the world. And so when we do a sequencing contract, 
Uh, we're just moving over to base space, but even right now, we still ship an array of hard disks to the customer because the data set is so big. Uh, I think two of the biggest concerns we knew that customers would have was going to be the um, uh, security of the cloud. So that's been interesting, dealing with that. Um, we use, obviously, SSL for transfer from the instrument up into the cloud, and we use AES-256 provided by uh, our friends at Amazon um, for at-rest encryption uh, once it's up there. Oh, that's perfect. Thanks. Um, and then secondly, there was this issue of what's the delay? If I have an instrument and I'm in Singapore and I'm running that instrument, how long is it going to take to upload to the cloud? Uh, it turns out it's... Um, let's get back one. Uh, it turns out it takes effectively zero time because if the instrument takes a day, we typically see even internationally about four minutes after the instrument has finished its genome run, all of that data is up in base space because we've incrementally uploaded it as the instrument has produced the data. So there's effectively no latency between when you um, finish a run and when that data is available up there. Um, the sequencing community is not uh, an enormous community, certainly not by consumer standards, uh, but just to give you an idea, there are uh, single-digit thousands of um, sequencing instruments out in the world, um, but we already have 6,000 users on base space, so we're very happy with the number of people that have signed up. And in fact, this next slide um, shows the growth. Uh, the left-hand side there is the end of uh, 2012, and then the right-hand side is uh, March, and you can see um, the acceleration. Unfortunately, I can't show the uh, actual numbers, um, but we do uh, mention that 80% of our machines are um, already connected up to base space. And if this video will run, which is probably asking too much. <laughs> oh, that's it. Can you click? Oh, yeah, there it goes. Um, this is interesting. This is um, sequencing, genome sequencing happening all over the world. So every time you see a red flash, this is over a period of about six months, there's a genome being sequenced somewhere. The blue is the accumulated um, number of genomes that have been sequenced in that area, and the green is the larger instruments that are just starting to connect up. Um, I start, we started them in November. And so if you look over that map of the world, it's kind of an interesting map of, of science and, and clinical uh, research in that you can see where we are on the, on the um, western side of the United States, a lot of activity, huge amount of activity um, on the east coast of the U.S., um, Western Europe, you can see in the middle left-hand side, you can see Iceland. There's a lot of uh, DNA sequencing that happens in Li Iceland because they have an unusual um, population of people there um, and very uniform, uh, racially uniform, a lot of medical records actually going back over hundreds of years. So it's a very interesting place for research. And oddly enough, I'm originally Australian. In the middle of Australia at Alice Springs, it turns out there's someone doing DNA sequencing and I don't know who that is. but. Um, <laughs> And what happens is because we ship these reagents, and the chemistry of the reagents is very complicated, so they're very sensitive to travel. So they're shipped on um, uh, dry ice, uh, and there's always the risk. You know, it's not, it's a lot more difficult. So even though our, even though our business model is somewhat of a, um, you might think of it as the, the HP print jet model, where you sell an instrument and then you have the reagents, in that case the inks that go out, the challenge we face is the very complex um, chemical processes that are happening. And so traditionally, you know, if something went wrong with a batch of uh, reagents, it would take a while because customers out in the field would start having problems with it and they'd think it was their mistake and they'd run it again. Now what happens is this data is in real time um, transmitted to base space where we can actually monitor it. So we can see the health of the instruments, we can see um, if there are any problems either in the instrument or the chemistry uh, as they happen. So it's become a very powerful tool for us in terms of customer support. And if a customer calls in and says, I have a problem, we can immediately pop up a screen and get detailed history of what's happened to that customer, the lots of reagents they have, and, and in fact, what they've been doing. On the instruments themselves, they have their own software. This just shows you, you can see in the center left there, um, that it only takes one click for them to take their instrument and connect it up to base space. From then on, it all happens transparently to them uh, as long as that instrument has an internet connection on it, and most of them do. Uh, this is a shot of the base space homepage. Um, we sort of keep a, a running log of information coming into the customer um, on the upper left. Um, and along the bottom, you can see runs, which shows what instruments are at what stage of completion. Um, projects, which are user-defined areas where people are um, 
can you know, organize, the equivalent of folders actually, where they can organize their experiments and app results because we have an app store and we are just uh, next month, in the next two weeks, rolling out something called iCredits, you can see in the upper right, which is a whole e-commerce system that lets people um, buy applications, computer time, storage, and so on, um, in, inside, completely inside of base space. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, a very powerful, we think the killer app for this um, is that uh, it eliminates the need to be shipping these hard disks uh, around, and it makes collaboration via sharing very, very easy. And it's pretty clear that that's become the um, uh, killer app for base space uh, out of the gate. This is an overview of how base space is structured. You can see the um, uh, infrastructure layer at the bottom. We think of it as a, um, as a platform which we offer to developers. And the developers are sometimes internal uh, Illumina developers. We have a very large number of um, biometrician, bioinformaticians working inside uh, of Illumina, um, but also to external partners. Um, and we do that by defining, uh, I think, a very um, powerful API um, and advertising, um, uh, publishing that API and working with developers. Uh, we've built an entire developer portal that gives them the ability to register, um, you know, get encryption keys, uh, and also a sandbox where they can uh, experiment with the API in real time. We've now got a range of uh, applications. I think, I think we have only, I'd say about half a dozen third-party developers have published already in there, and we have something like 10 uh, Illumina applications. So something like 15 or 20 total applications, but that's growing quickly. Last time I looked, we had 200 um, developers active inside our developer portal. Um, Again, if you think of what happens with small um, bioinformatics software companies, it's difficult for them to get distribution. They tend to be smaller companies, there's very few large ones, and it's very challenging for them to get to the customer. BaseSpace is storing already the customer's data. It's streaming up into Amazon and it's up there. So this becomes a great platform for um, developers to be able to put their tools up there and get great access to customers. Just briefly, a little bit about where we see this going um, in terms of healthcare. Uh, as I mentioned, there's a lot of activity in uh, prenatal um, genetic diagnosis right now, um, and a lot of activity around cancer. So we want to bring two things together, patient genomes, which we already store in base space, uh, and also patient records, which of course brings a lot of complexity around um, HIPAA and legal requirements. Um, part of that is overcome by the fact that, for example, in the case of cancer patients, they tend to be very eager to collaborate in you know, research uh, and efforts to discover uh, new treatments. And so um, you know, creating an environment where the appropriate legal consents are created that enables research, uh, we think is pretty doable in that area. But you end up having research falling into, into or I should say you have, end up having services fall into two main areas. Partly it's research and partly it's clinical because of course, you're trying to do both. When a, when a patient with cancer is admitted to a cancer hospital, the sequencing that happens there is clinical sequencing, which is aimed at helping that patient. There's also a process of aggregating many patients, many patient records, and enabling that to be an environment that researchers can go through and make data mining driven um, discoveries, say linking um, the outcomes, which you see in patient records, with the mutations in patient cancers over very large numbers of people. So, you know, one of the key things that has to happen is there has to be a standardized mutation database. Right now, it's kind of the Wild West, and that doesn't work very well in clinical applications. So working out, if I see a particular mutation in a, in a patient's DNA, what is the implication of that? What, what should I, how should I respond? What is the research that speaks to that mutation? What are the biological pathways that are impacted by that mutation? So there's a strong need for a standardized database, database of mutations. One of the areas, and, and if you're familiar with 23andMe, you see that. 23andMe is not in whole genome sequencing yet. It uses a different technology, um, uh, which is more, uh, I guess, a, a lower sampling point, um, known as genotyping, uh, using uh, microarray chips. But there's the category of people which are healthy and are proactive and want to know, what's my likely predisposition to diabetes? What's my predisposition to a particular cancer? 
So there's a screening uh, component of what's going to happen um, inside healthcare. Um, another interesting area is um, drug efficacy and toxicity. We all respond very differently to different drugs because obviously we have slightly different biological makeups. And so we're seeing a lot of interest in every time a prescription is written, what is the impact of that person's genome on that prescription? You may get a different dosage because you may be particularly sensitive to that drug. You may, in fact, find that drug toxic. I'd like to know that early up. Um, and so there's a lot of interest in tying those two things together. And then the, the actual um, patient, where you're trying to discover what's wrong with the patient, um, there are many categories of this that are already active. Um, one interesting one is in the rare diseases, rare genetic diseases in newborns. So quite a number of newborns um, arrive in the world very ill, and it's very hard to work out what is wrong with them. Um, it turns out that many times, um, if a doctor is having trouble treating it, it is some genetic disease. And so by doing a whole human genome um, sequence of that newborn, you can very quickly determine um, if it's genetic disease. Uh, some of the time, that indicates that there um, should be a treatment straight away, and the treatment is clear. Other times, unfortunately, we don't know what the treatments are. Um, it turns out typically, though, parents uh, at least uh, feel more comfortable having a diagnosis, um, even if, unfortunately, there isn't a treatment available yet. And that's a, that's a challenge overall for um, DNA sequencing and, and genetics in healthcare, is we're at this very early stage um, of discovery. And uh, it's very challenging right now to work out exactly what to do under every different circumstance. And I would say, pulling a number out of nowhere, I'd say around 50% of the time right now, um, information that's coming out of a genetic sequence is useful to the clinician in treating the patient. And about 50% of the time, we're not quite sure what to do with it. That, of course, becomes fodder for research. Uh, but we have, in summary, um, found the cloud an amazing environment for aggregating this data, um, using it for research, and we think over uh, literally the next uh, two years, an increasing, um, increasingly interesting and powerful environment uh, for doing uh, clinical uh, diagnosis as well. Thanks very much for your time. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much, Alex. And we've gone a little bit over time, so we'll, we'll make this uh, very quick. But, you know, what, what Alex just described there in Base Space is a great example of, uh, of an organization that had a high-performance computing problem initially, how to accelerate genome sequencing, how to fix that mismatch between the sequencer's life cycle and the servers, right? But then quickly moving into finding an entirely new business model as a result of using cloud services for that. So uh, thank you, Alex, again for, uh, for participating.